Hey everyone, welcome back. Um, I wonder if you can all like uh, do me a favor and just take in a deep breath for, for yourselves. And exhale. And let's take another deep breath for the nation. And then one more breath for Black Lives Matter and all those affected by police brutality. And um, I'm just gonna hand this over. I don't have much to say other than, you know, I'll probably reiterate what I said last week, which is uh, I hope you are all doing well and that you're safe and healthy and, um, and that you're I am certainly thinking of all of you and I really appreciate you being here that I, I know that your time is valuable, um, but that you're here and that you're here to support your craft and 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 in a way this is a an opportunity for self care and to 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 share what your thoughts are so i'm really happy to have uh, someone I really deeply care about and whom i've worked with in the past uh, she was actor on my play last uh, summer at New Harmony. And I, you know, she, uh, Diana, Diana was one of the first um, folks I wanted to have on my project. So I'm really glad she's returning the favor. So Diana Burbano, thank you for coming. The floor is yours. Thank you, Tlala. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here with everybody today in community. I see some gorgeous, gorgeous faces that I know and that I don't know. And I just want to welcome you all here into the space. Um, again, in community. So what I'd like to do first, um, I see there's a few of us who are not, let me see, I'm going to put it, let me see how many people we've got. Okay. So what I'd like to do first, just because um, I want us all to unmute our mics when, when I give you the signal and just maybe two sentences that you want to put out into the world. If you see somebody you love, say hello. If you want to say something that you've been holding in and you want to say it in public, say it. So just two, two or three sentences and then we'll come back and, uh, okay, unmute. Everybody unmute and say what you want to say. I'm so happy you're here. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy to be here. Birthday present coming up. Happy birthday. 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 So I know that can be a little tricky with the raising hand. So if you know how to do that, do that. If not, do this or just a tug on my virtual sleeve. We'll figure out how to get you um, sharing out, okay? So the prompt for today, I'm gonna put it in the chat for you. I've got two of them that are things that I have just heard over the past couple of days that I thought were kind of interesting. So they are this. And you can either do one, do both, do whatever you want. It can be dramatic. It can be just whatever you want to write. There's no, no restrictions. Just write what you want to write. So the first one is you are at the table and you do not have a seat, your lunch. That's the first one. I'll repeat that. If you are at the table and you do not have a seat, your lunch. Or, or an and, mirrors, windows and sliding glass doors okay mirrors windows and sliding glass doors and everybody just write for five and we'll be back just keep an ear out for the alarm
Okay. So that's us. So go ahead and take your time. <laughs> take your time finishing up whatever you're working on. You don't have, we don't have to be super binary and on the moment. Just finish up what you're doing. I'll just talk a little bit. Um, so uh, one of the things that I really like about teaching these classes, especially right now, is I really like hearing from you. So uh, that's my offer that if you want to read what you wrote, you're very welcome to read what you wrote. I invite it. So um, if you know how to raise your hand, raise your hand if you're ready. And if I'll, I see there's two screens and I'll try to catch you. So just make it really clear if you want to read and uh, I'd love to hear what you got for me. Make things, these things easy if you'd like to raise your hand, that is great. But I have also uh, um, made it so that anybody can unmute yourself. So just go ahead and make sure that you're muted while other people are talking. And when one person uh, finishes then the next person can turn on their, turn on their mic. So Monica, would you like to start us off? Um, when, uh, mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. That's the house. That's this nightmare abode. Everywhere an illusion, a reminder of fragility, a reflection of time that has become my body and face in this middle age, or more like past the middle age of this life. She tries to open the window. She covers the mirror. Painted opaque with mustard, lipstick, the feathers from a ripped, ripped pillow, anything at her disposal. She tries to open the sliding glass door. It is stuck. Break the fucking glass. No. Why not? I have enough broken. Call someone. There is no one left. Glass echoes. Breathe in the air. Feel the smooth, cool relief of the glass. Yes, that's it. Approach it. Bring your palms to the glass, imprint yourself, your hands, your body, your nose. Look, look, see that you are not trapped looking out, but you are free on the outside looking in. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. Well done. Okay, who wants to go next? Yeah? Alexis. Okay. I worked off of if you are at the table and you do not have a seat, your lunch. The ceiling is low. It's above my head, but lower. I tilt my head back, stand on my tiptoes. It's a second ceiling. Above it, the sky. What are they doing on top of the ceiling? Are they dancing on the clouds? Can they splash in the rain? Do rainbows sit in the palm of your hand? I want to find out. If I jump, my nose will smash into it. If I ask to be, to be invited, I'm a pest. Little girls are meant to dance on the ceiling. Little girls aren't meant to dance on the ceiling. Then again, ceilings are meant to be broken. I will destroy the legs of the ceiling. Little girls with little legs, sturdier than the legs of your fragile ceiling. Thank you. Thank you, Alexis. Thank you. All right. See, Herbert raised his hand in the chat. Yeah, great. One moment. Hi, do you hear me? Yeah. There we go. Yeah. I don't have a seat at the table. I said, I don't have a seat at the table. First of all, you knew I was coming, so why isn't there a seat at the table? Hmm? But like the great Shirley Chisholm said, if there's not a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. So I brought my goddamn folding chair. Make room for me, man. I have a seat at the table now. More bread, please. These folks left me no bread, and I would like some bread and butter. Now, what is the topic of discussion today? I'll wait. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I think Beautiful. I see Tatiana Marie next in the chat. 
Hi. You're unmuted. Hi. I worked off of um, mirrors, mir mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. Right. An opening, a new beginning, a crack, a crack that has been growing, a crack that is spreading, threading through our very existence. Humanity, a choice to survive or to thrive, a crack, an opening, a widening of perspective of minds trying to stay alive, alive, a live wire, a sizzling, a rumbling, an explosion, explosion of truth, an explosion of consciousness, a new world order, a realness, a rawness, a standing in the unknowing, knowing that this doesn't feel right, knowing that this is wrong, strong and wrong, strong arm, strong arm of justice, strong arm of peace, strong arm twisted behind our backs, broken backs, hardworking backs, trying to live backs, breathe through your back, a stab in the back. Ooh. Thank you. Thank you. Marsha, you're unmuted. Thanks. Um, I did the first prompt. Okay. Alote, veggies, delicacy. I'm privy to the makings. Before I was at the table, slices of me trimmed, and now I see hungry eyes staring me down. I've been prepped for consumption. And I know what I've been told to wait to be nourishment for others. This is my purpose. But fuck that. I hop off the table, I roll, I pop. I'm crunching the grass on my way to freedom. My future on the horizon, a newfound glory. Yes, thank you, Marcia. Thank you. Okay, Andy? You, Andy, you're unmuted. Oh my God, my heart is racing. I love this so much. Um, I did the mirrors, glass sliding doors. Okay. I'm trying to write without going back and editing senselessly, writing something more than wanting the mirror of representation to be better, but that's something everyone has heard and everyone has said time and time again. But isn't that the problem? Perhaps it's just because I got off a department wide zoom call about how our faculty has continually failed us. So it's always on my mind. The self-proclamation of being a warrior of representation is a false god. This god is worse than malicious, she is absent. With all her touted strength, she is as fragile as the floor-length mirror she claims to be. The crack started years ago, before my time, before yours, and before the life of the next person who comes to your mind. They snaked up her spotless pantsuit, but she went to the tailors for a quick patch-up. When my friends look in the mirror, they see nothing. Expected of vampires for sure, but my friends carry no such burden or villainy. I've seen them bleed, and I've seen the sun kiss their arms and call them her own and the love of her life. And that's when time went off. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Lovely. I think I see Viviana. Hello. Hello. Um, yeah. So I heard the two prompts together and I just immediately pictured this Cuban woman's living room that I walked into like a year ago and I just like made a little scene off of it. So mine's really different from everyone else's I think. Ooh, cool. Anyway, um, mommy makes lunchtime in the parlor. It's a Cuban parlor, but a Cuban rich person parlor. The kind that makes my friend Gemma uncomfortable. Mirror walls with bronzish gilding, candle holders everywhere and La Virgen Maria white and pink roses, some of them dried, and rosaries hanging everywhere. Lunchtime is when mommy gets to perform. The white porcelain with green leaves on it and utensils with metal handles as intricate as the swirling bark patterns on the outsides of trees. Gemma is scared of all of it. It don't matter that the food is served as tostones and black beans with bits of chorizo in it and yuca and rice and pork chops soaked in brown sauce and glazed red onions. I don't know, something about it just feels wrong, she'll say on the Parkside curb, but maybe that's just rich people anyways. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, I think, let's see. Do we have Marilo next? Marilo? Hi. <clears throat> uh, I uh, use the prompt, uh, if you're at the table and you do not have a seat, your lunch. I'd like to take this time to welcome you all here today. Sorry, what did you say? Oh yes, I might remind you all that lunch today is being sponsored by KPMG. Your lunch is comprised of two things, honor and blood. What do these things mean to you? When seated at the table, you are to have your honor and feel your blood, 
Your blood is something that comes from generations and generations of ancestors. Who are my ancestors? This is bullshit. You don't know what you're talking about. Sit at the table and you don't have your lunch. What is, what is it you want? I want to talk about you, about time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for sharing. Does anybody else want to share before we? Or if you don't want to share what you wrote, if you want to tell me a little bit about how that felt, that's also uh, something I'd love to hear as well. I'm wondering uh, who's writing right now? Just you can just raise your hand. Who's actually actively working on something? And who's feeling completely stuck and uninspired and kind of not able to do anything? Okay. All right. I see Amanda has raised her hand. Where are you, Amanda? Amanda, if you can get there before I do, go ahead and unmute yourself. I was about the, the second one, the feeling completely stuck and uninspired. Okay. It's not that I, I feel uninspired per se, it's just that, um, well, in, in the past week, especially, it's just been very difficult to have anything else on my mind besides the protests um, and like do anything. Mm -hmm. And so I'm feeling stuck as a person, not only just as, a, as, a, as an artist, like that was already something that I was trying to figure out with quarantine and isolation and all summer plans being canceled. I'm, a, I'm an undergraduate student. So like I had, you know, whatever the typical really active, crazy summer planned and then that all disappeared, rightfully so. But um, yeah, it's just been very, I don't want to say stagnant. Stagnant is not the right word because it's like, it's like when you shake up the Coca-Cola bottle and it's all, you know, buzzing and waiting for that explosion moment. But yeah, writing is hard right now. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. And I, I just want to offer a bit of advice that I got that sort of has helped me, you know, because I have to, some of the things I have to write because somebody needs something and it's on a deadline, but like my, the projects that are like the ones that are close to my heart, I'm finding very difficult right now. And a mentor offered to me that we are storytellers, right? And we are in a gathering moment. This is such a moment. We are living a moment, uh, especially those of us who are younger, maybe, or although, or maybe not. I don't know. I don't know your lived experience, but because we are storytellers who gather, um, perhaps it's okay for this to be a moment of listening, of really active listening and just not feeling the pressure to produce all the time, which I think is really heavy for us, especially especially for this group, perhaps, because we're trying to establish ourselves in this society and we're trying we're working on really breaking through this glass ceiling, this barrier that we've um, that has always been imposed on us. Uh, you know, talking today, Alexis was in the group with some real veteranos talking about how things, you know, we keep talking about how things are changing, how things are changing, but I've been at this 30 years, maybe. I don't know how much has it really changed. Uh, to be uh, honestly, are we? We're still working in white institutions. We're still working as marginalized people. We're still having to be called diverse people when, in fact, we're not a diverse. What's a diverse? Is that even how? Why are they using that as a noun? You know, it's a really interesting moment. So. Um, that's part of, what's one of the reasons, one of the things I wanted to talk about is just, you know, give yourself a break. I think these little, these workshops are wonderful and I hold them every week and I just encourage, people are always saying to me, I'm really sorry, I didn't write my pages this week. And I'm like, okay, that's totally cool. What do you want to talk about? It's totally fine. I mean, writing is also talking, cogitating. I, this is our, I, for some of my colleagues, this is supposed to be our convening season where we meet each other and we sit and we break bread and we talk. And for artists, especially writers, who we are isolated anyway, these are the moments of community that I think we are missing. And we have, we have to be allowed to mourn that as well, right? So my only thing is just be kind, be kind to each other um, and to yourselves. And I wanna share, Amanda has put in the chat that she, I run a campus Latinx theater group. So I'm channeling the outrage into trying to work to create equity there, even if I can't personally, personally contribute to our canon. Thank you. 
Thank you for that. Yeah. So, um, all right, so we're talking, so we're in a moment, right? We're in this moment of change, of, of transition. So what can we do, right? That's the big question. Um, I, I, I'm really interested in this question and I would love to hear some of your answers for it too. I feel like we're in a moment where we can grab hold of the narrative ourselves um, as artists because we, we're sort of on an equal footing, right? at the moment. The big institutions don't know what the hell they're doing. They, they have, some of them have really great artists like Herbert, like Tlaloc who are helping them, but some of them are literally stuck in, I don't know what to do that won't piss off my subscribers. And I don't know what to do that, cause virtual isn't live theater and I don't know what to do. And like I said this afternoon, it doesn't matter. Fuck up, make mistakes, be a mess, be a disaster. Let that Zoom reading suck. I mean, it's really okay because we're discovering new forms, right? Um, like when the revolution came through for actors and you could, there was an equality for a moment of being able to submit your picture everywhere because they couldn't figure out how to get you out of the breakdown services. Like everybody got the notifications for a while and it was so equitable. Like you could get into all kinds of casting calls because it was, it was open, everything was open. That's where we are now as creators. They haven't locked us out because they can't even figure out how to open this door. Like they don't have a key to this, but we do, we're here, right? So my thing as a, as a writer and a writing teacher is just allow the mess, allow the crap, allow it to be terrible, let go of the need to be perfect, let go of it. And it will serve you so well because, I mean, we all, we all feel like, oh, that was awful. I wish that I hadn't gone out into the world. Yes, I feel that, I hold that, I know that. But, but this, I think, really just pushing yourself beyond the, the feelings of comfort, comfort, just pushing a little bit beyond that is gonna serve you in this particular moment. And you have colleagues who will hold you. There are people here, you can look all around at this particular group. These people will hold you, they will help you, they will talk to you, you know? Um, anyway, so that's, that's something that's really important to me. And also important to me is to hear your voices. Um, People are making videos. People are going on Instagram and reading monologues they've written. People are forming collectives where they're uh, doing Facebook groups. Um, all of that. People are joining and talking and doing. So again, I want to encourage that as well. So I'm open if anybody wants to um, pop in with anything they'd like to say. Yeah, Alexis. I see you because you're right under me. Um, Amanda, thank you so much for sharing. I really identify with a lot of the things that you've said. I'm also undergraduate. Um, I recently came back from NTI uh, for their playwriting semester and I came home with like pages. I was ready. I wanted to put everything on stage and I came back during quarantine and thought, wow, Fresno, love what you've done with the place, some changes. <laughs> and it felt like there was just this big pause on on the momentum I felt that was happening especially for summer that's when all of us artists have so much time and almost resources because everyone's out of school so one of the positive things that I've been able to look at this has been time is the commodity of artists and so I can sit on my laptop and write two pages one day or maybe write five pages the next day or maybe go the next the day after that and delete everything because I want to take time to edit and it's really allowed me to feel like there isn't a rush and a pressure to produce but to really sit and be with my work and create something that's going to make me happy for the day it's going to make me happy furthering the project and it's also uh it's time to get scrappy and like creating with whatever we have at our disposal. <laughs> I, I started making some videos and I was stubborn and was not going to buy a tripod. So I just stacked like a bunch of books and used a stuffed animal for focus. It's, it's all about just finding those resources. And also one more thing and I'll stop talking. <laughs> but um, ha Finding those other artists that are just itching to work. They're just itching to do reading and they're itching to um, like just read your pages or even someone who just wants to grammatically look over pages or just be a sounding board to bounce ideas off of. 
uh, I think that those artists are the ones that are going to come out of this because this will end that are going to come out of this still having that spark and even burning brighter. Mm -hmm. Connect with each other in the chat. If somebody says something that, you know, that you think is cool, just connect with each other and see if they want to connect. Uh, this is a good time to do that too. See what you can, you can build, build community with um, people who, uh, you know, people who you get and who get you as well. We, we talk a lot about, um, at the conference, the PCG conference, we talked a lot about microaggressions and how difficult it is to navigate in um, spaces that, that are, uh, you know, white majority. And, and so there is that also that sometimes you need to go back to find a, a group, a group of people who maybe have a little bit of a more of a relationship to your reality than what you are forced to sometimes do, the performative things you some, sometimes have to do to exist in this world. Because we all want our stuff produced, right? I mean, I know I do. I want my stuff produced and I wanna work in those spaces. I, I, I'm just being honest. I get a lot of, well, we're gonna build our own thing. We're gonna do our own thing. Yes, I have done my own thing. I have a Latina theater company, but I want to take over those spaces. I, I deeply, you know? I want to storm that castle. And I know I have cohort in here who, who have stormed the castle, who are storming the castle. That's okay. You know, we don't have to be comfortable or nice or we can fit in. And, and one of the things that I do, um, I don't have as much power as some, but what I try to do now that I'm, I'm getting a little better known is I try to bring people I like. Like I, I had a conversation with a literary agent who said to me, just just do this before you go into the meeting, the producer's meeting, write down, take a list, say, these are the directors I really want to work with. These are the designers I really want to work with. Yes, they're all Latinx women. That's who I want to work with. Or yes, this is the designer. You love him. You've worked with him. I want this one. No, I don't want that one. You know, there, there are, those are the little things that you can do that you would be surprised. You get in a room with all these people and you're all of a sudden like, okay, I'll have that old white dude direct my play. Okay, awesome. And then you've lost power because you got to take your power when you can get it. We, we you know, I, that's another offer I give you. Um, and one last thing, this is kind of, a, I'm swirling around my topics because my post-it notes are all scattered. But um, I found myself doing something. I, I had a, a live reading of a play, one of my plays, a very, a difficult play, a traumatic play. Uh, and two things came of that, that, that I have to examine in myself. So I'm an immigrant uh, from Colombia. Spanish is my first language. I write, I write very bilingually. I try to be mindful that a lot of actors don't speak Spanish. A lot of Latinx actors, that's not their experience. And so that is something I'm mindful in. And I found myself, I had to catch myself when I was uh, Spanish shaming somebody um, even though my Spanish is pretty, actually, I think my Spanish is pretty shitty because I, I usually use English, but I found myself thinking, oh, well, I'd really like her accent to be better. And I had to literally stop myself and say, no, no, do not Spanish shame people ever. I was so, and I had to go back and apologize and say, I'm really sorry. That's so ingrained in me that somehow my Spanish isn't good enough or, or whatever speak your Spanish or don't speak your Spanish. Don't, it's, it's a, that is a really another politicized thing that we do to each other, I think, as Latinx artists that I feel we don't talk about enough, right? It's like some of us have accents, some of us don't have accents, some of us can't speak it at all, some of us are fluent, um, but we don't exist on the same plane in the bilingualness of ourselves. I mean, not, in, not here, not in, in these spaces. So I'm interested to hear if anybody has any experiences on that particular. Um, yeah, Giselle. Whoops. Okay. Hi, Diana. Hi, <laughs> um, I think this is um, sort of similar to what you're saying, but a bit different. Um, I'm of Brazilian origins and I have a really hard time finding Brazilian artists in the US in theater specifically. Um, and I feel like I'm I'm already isolated in 
the whiteness of the theater industry. And then I continue to feel isolated in the Latinx community <laughs> because I'm like, oh my God, everyone here speaks Spanish. Like I speak my Spanish Portuguese, you know, cause like it's sort of similar. And I can, I, I do know some Spanish, but it's not my native language. It's Portuguese is my native language. That's what I speak at home. That's my language of love. That's the language I speak to my mom with, the language I pray in. And like, I'm getting emotional, but it is hard to feel like the outsider in the group that I'm not supposed to feel like an outsider in. Mm-hmm. And my mom and I had a conversation about it. I was, she was like, I was like, mom, I'm so excited about these like Latinx um, playwriting classes that I'm taking and sessions. And she was like, but you're not Latinx, you're Brazilian. <laughs> you're not Hispanic. And I was like, fuck, then what the hell am I? Like who, what community can I even belong to? So um, I don't know, I hope I am welcomed and I have felt welcomed, but um, it is hard to ignore Um, this other, like, I don't know, schism that I also feel. Thank you. Thank you for telling us that. Yeah. I think that's definitely something we don't think about. Thank you, Giselle. Viviana. I think, I think honestly, like where the problem is, is that we don't have enough stories that reflect all the nuance that like, because it's not just, there is language, like there's, there's there's the language issue there's also race issue like the fact that we don't all look the same that like some of us look really really white but like don't like but like don't pass as latinx like on stage but like definitely we identify as latinx and then there's people who are like black and then that's like a whole other thing and then it's just like ah so like i don't know like I, i i encountered this problem um when i was casting for my hurricane maria play Um, because I I wrote like a main character that was very similar to myself in that like she like like spent most of her time growing up in the U.S. but like had family back in PR but was fluent in Spanish as a kid and then like her Spanish got "Eh." (laughs) and like in and like I wrote a version of myself that was like a lot more insecure about Spanish than I actually am like I'm I'm fine like I'm a Spanish tour guide at MSG like I I get by Um, but because like we wrote it that way we ended up and like also like like I'm like was very emerging at the time so like we just cast whoever was available not that many people auditioned um but we ended up casting like a very very white passing uh Cuban girl and I remember that my director was like super weird about the fact that when she spoke Spanish she just sounded like gringa um and like she tried to like go after her for that and and, like she was like like weird about casting her and I was like but like what do you want her to do (laughs) Um, and I just, and I just feel like what we need is stories to like, like have those specific nuances written in. Like we need a Brazilian character that's weird about Spanish. <laughs> like we need, like, uh, we need like white Cuban girl that doesn't know what to do. And like, I, I come across that those like every once in a while, like I think, uh, uh, about, oh God, what was the play that went up at WP recently? That was very famous. That like got a lot of attention. I can't remember now. But I remember that they like wrote in like a white Republican Cuban lords. girl. Huh? You're dead drug lords. Yes. And they wrote in like like a white passing Cuban girl who had like a Republican sign out on her front lawn. Um, because that's real. Like there's like the there's like so much nuance in our community. Um, but it's not really reflected on stage. Like I feel like there's just a bunch of stock characters that get thrown around. And I get frustrated even at Latinx playwrights. Um, who who defer to the stock. I think that we need to hold ourselves accountable. Um, I might say a controversial statement here, but, but I remember I, I, I got incensed watching um, the Mexican Medea that went up at the public because I was just like, these are, but the, that's like st- stock characters all over the place. <laughs> I was so mad. And then people, and then it was so uncomfortable because most of the audience were like white people that were like, I just saw it. I saw the Latinx people. I pat myself on the back. <laughs> and I was just like, I was just like, literally every single Latina woman in here is a star character and I can't handle this. Anyway, that was a rant about a completely different play. But I just, in general, like what I think we need, we need more nuanced writing. And like, that's what I try to do in my 
playwriting like i'm just like i wish we just yeah. had like freaking human complex people on stage and like they just happen to be latinx like <laughs> anyway rant true. over thank you viviana uh andy and then alex hernandez yeah um it the whole um like conversation about spanish in particular has always been something that has hit extremely close to home as a very an extremely white passing Latinx person. Um, I'm half white, I'm half Puerto Rican. And um, I was one of the people who knew a little bit of Spanish as a kid and just in the environment that my personality and my interests and my community was being cultivated in it, it, it just left. It wasn't important. And so now it's extremely hard for me to learn the language and I remember it was actually while working on Divisadero at New Harmony last year. I remember um, Damaso, it was, it was during a rehearsal because I remember we were all going around the table and talking about stuff like this. And I expressed how insecure I am in my accent when speaking Spanish because I go to a very uh, predominantly white university. And so in the theater department, you know that for every, the show that I was most recently cast in, I love it to death. And it was a new play, but it was canceled because of COVID. It's called En Las Sombras by Jordan Ramirez Puckett. It's on New Play Exchange. I will plug it until the day I die. It's a beautiful right. story. Right. But it was also, it started as a bilingual play, but that was actually taken away from her because of pushback from the university saying, these audiences aren't going to understand what's going on. So she had to write, a completely new version of it. Mm. But um, even everyone of Latinx descent in the cast, um, we were all kind of like performing the kind of Latinx identity that the white production board wanted to see from us. And I didn't realize how hurtful that was until I had to live through it and my friends had to live through it. And I was able to articulate that to my white friends, the ones who are like actual allies and keep sticking by even after the fair weather allies have passed and people stop talking about it on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, just that kind of language policing within our own community. And it's so good that we are catching ourselves on that and correcting it and saying, okay, I made the mistake but I'm not going to make this a pity party about me. I'm gonna learn from it and I'm gonna make your experience better because I made that mistake and I'm gonna make it better for you. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where I'm going with this. This will be the end of that part of it, but yeah. So thank you everyone for saying what you have. You are absolutely not the fuck alone. I am right here with you. Thank you. Yeah, well, we gotta catch ourselves. Us older people have to say, oh, I'm gonna learn. Yeah. I get called on a lot of my shit and I go, I, I always do that thing. We're like, what? I'm so mad. And then I'm like, no, get soft. Have that soft center because you're learning too. You got to learn. You have to stay learning. Um, let me have, uh, who do we have? Alex. Alex Hernandez. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just really excited to be here because I was like, I think I'm going to take a nap instead. <laughs> And so like pushing myself to do Zoom class, like the Zoom classes when I can um, and like going over that like screen fatigue bump is like and being able to sit in community like this is really great. Uh, so I've been working with a collective on a bilingual adaptation of a play. And one of the things that we've been trying to like ground our work on is the audience that we created and like the way that we're creating work is like our motto, like the motto that I've been working with is like nothing about us without us and so like just really thinking about like okay um and specifically with the spanish like we've had all these conversations and we have different people in our collective writing and it's like i only know border spanish i only know Honduran spanish i only know spanglish and so like trying to make these rules so that all those different types of spanishes and spanglishes can live in this world that we're creating because ultimately like it's not real you know and if it's not like if other people like white audience members or non-Spanish speakers cannot like follow in, into that storyline and hold that suspension and disbelief and this play is not for them. 
Mm -hmm. right um and so we are really trying to hold space for each other and be like it's okay that you don't know how to spell this it's okay that you don't know where the accents go like just tell me what you're trying to say and collectively like we can figure it out um so that's been kind of like one of like how we've been anchoring our work but then also like thinking about how you were talking about power i think it's a really great time to look at like what power structures we're upholding specifically from eurocentric like college training and looking at how we want to dismantle those so like for us rest has been really important in our group and we only meet once a week and we're trying to be um communicating about i'm tired like i can't do the assigned scenes that i was supposed to do today or like last weekend we took a week off like we took our day off because there's just so much going on in the world and so really looking at opening these lines of communication and being like i'm not going to produce what i need to produce and that's okay like i need to take this time off to process this Yes. Um, and so just, yeah, just really looking at those structures and then also like looking at how we want to implement, implement these and like our future work when we go back into working to institutions. Thank you. Thank you. I, I you know, I, I, I have a whole scene in Ghosts of Bogota that is done entirely and I have two that are done entirely in Spanish with no translations and they're on purpose. They're meant to be, um, a, they're meant to be combative to people who don't speak Spanish. It's meant to be a combat even to Latinos who don't speak Spanish. It's meant, it's, it's done on purpose to invoke a certain feeling, right? Um, and I think it, it strikes me that it's so, it's, is it only Spanish that gets picked on like that? Is it only Spanish that becomes too radical? I mean, does it happen if there's Russian in it? I'm really curious. I would love to find artists of other cultures who write in other languages and ask them, do they say the same things to you or do they think it's poetic because it's Russian, you know? Yeah, yeah, there's some great stuff in the chat, by the way, if we can get that out into the world, there's some really exciting stuff happening in the chat. All right, Solana, where are you? you hola. Hi, hola. Um, so I'm late to the game. I haven't been able, because I've been in school, but most of what I study is uh, theater management. So it's really beautiful to be in this, in this room because I'm storming the castle. I'm one of those, I'm attempting to storm the castle. Um, but I think something that for me that I know that as an administrator, it's been very hard is because you have to perform whiteness for whiteness to welcome you into the space. And then how do you disrupt from the inside? So I always know that like from an artist standpoint, like, no, I don't particularly write. I don't know, I consider myself a writer, but I do know people and I know people I can be like, hey, you should do it. But I always wonder, I guess, maybe the older people who are a little bit more established can let me know where do you, how far does that performativity, oof, performativity come in before you can go, okay, yes, I played your game. I checked the boxes for you. Are you gonna let me do my thing now or are we gonna keep playing the game? And how do you balance that, I guess? That's very good. Does anybody wanna speak to that? That's not me. I mean, I know, I, you end up pissing a lot of people off, right, Tlaloc? <laughs> you end up pissing a lot of people off because you're not being the good little, yeah. yeah. So do you want to talk a little bit, Tlaloc, about that? Uh, about what exactly, just say, uh, repeat the question. About, Solana, about, uh, how, about performative whiteness in spaces. Ooh, I, yeah, I, well, I mean, the, there is a sense that, that that there is a certain and you know I mean there's a certain way to behave in, 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 when you're dealing with uh, the decision makers and gatekeepers and you have to dot the i's and cross the t's in the way that you don't come across as intimidated and certainly I've experienced that as a as a as a Chicano as a Latinx man as an immigrant um, it's uh, it's particularly challenging and and we all know this by the count, uh, you know, what we've been hearing from black creatives throughout the week in terms of what they've experienced in training, um, drama schools, in the profession, how one single misstep or defiance or just even asking for justification for a particular direction can lead to ostracization, blacklisting, uh, gaslighting, 
Um, and, and we have to just stop. We, we have to, for me, if there isn't that kind of collaboration that we all talk about amongst white creatives and that is not extended to people of color, then what are we doing in this industry? What is this industry about? If it's not about the collective, you know, storytelling that we do, we all say that we we believe in the shared humanity of the theater, but but that is not. We know that that's not extended to all people, and only a few seem to have the power to to be able to greenlight. The particular stories and oftentimes they're going to choose the stories that that make them comfortable or make them that center their their experience and all, all too often that experience is white and middle class and set in a new york apartment with a sofa so <laughs> um you have to just keep fighting the good fight even i have to be aware in terms of when i'm writing that I'm not falling into the same tropes that that kind of come into my head about, oh, if I, well, maybe if this play only has five characters, it'll be at least read or considered. No, write the play that you need to write and focus on the story, focus on the, focus on the, the notes that you get from uh, cherished and trusted colleagues and people that you know so that you continue to get feedback without people trying to rewrite your play in order to accommodate a white audience mm -hmm. so i'll or, just yeah. leave that down that's great and also to accommodate whatever like i i just submitted to the yale prize and it's like five characters only you're like really really the boston court is four characters so well there went that because i don't have a fork any play i have one play that has less than four characters it's like these gatekeepers like anything they can do to keep people out it just doesn't seem generous to me you know right and I mean? they they can go ahead and produce uh what was that play um uh charles the third which has like 24 white people and then they'll 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 program the one person you know black woman show and let's not even talk about what they do with classics when they just all just sort of plop people of color in roles that really don't are not a comfortable fit. Anne's Warehouse doing uh, the Hamlet with Ruth Nega. It's they put bodies bodies into roles without considering what the meaning of the body in the role is. I think that's I could do a whole hour just on that, but I'm not going to. So uh, we have let's do I know. Sonia, are you there? I would love to hear from you. And then we'll do uh, Viviana, because I've heard from you before, but I haven't heard from, from this particular person. I'll unmute you. There we go. Where are you? Unmute myself. Sonia, are you there? Is your microphone Hi, working? Can you hear me? Just You're barely. Yes. Me. Is it good now? Better? Worse? I have no idea. It's a little bit. Just, just come a little okay. closer to your mic. Yeah. OK, great. Um, yeah, so I was just sort of in the chat kind of speaking about the disassociation of white audiences with um, Indian languages, there's like, in the conversations we were having with Spanish, there are about, oh God, 30 languages in India. <laughs> I'm South Asian, I'm Indian. I grew up with like two or three of them particularly. And the one that American audiences are used to seeing, or I say um, fetishizing is Hindi because of Bollywood movies. Um, and when it doesn't sound like that, so I grew up with Tamil from Tamil Nadu in South India. When it doesn't sound like that, it's very off-putting because Tamil is very reflexive as a language. Mm -hmm. um, like, like it's very reflexive and kind of pulls back in and it disassociates people. Um, and that's something that I've been trying to figure out a way to do. And I've also looked at a lot of like Latinx plays to see how language works because I haven't seen many Indian plays with Tamil and English and a bunch of different languages. So I've mainly been looking at like, I know it's a TV show, but Jane the Virgin, having the grandma just speak in Spanish and having the kids speak her back in English. That was some of my experience growing up with my parents. Um, so it's a lot of like that and also how language is used as different communities. So my parents will speak a language that I don't know on purpose. So I don't know what they're talking about and then we'll talk to me in a language that I know 
so they can talk about me in front of me as if I'm not there. <laughs> and I don't know if that's like a thing. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to kind of add to the conversation that's not just a Latinx experience. It's been my experience as someone who is Indian. And I come to these spaces because I have found in my life a, a lot of overlap between Latinx communities and Indian communities. And that's not necessarily talked about um, because the assumption, there's usually one assumption about Indian people and that's not always true. So I tend to try to pull that apart and be in affinity spaces like this because it helps me as a writer grow and learn from other playwrights of color, and communities of color. So that's all. Thank you, Donna. Thank you for that. We're sort of, I'm gonna call on Bibiana and then Linda. So Bibiana. Oh, yes, hi. Um, I just want to say that uh, I've had, can you hear me very well? Okay, yeah. great. Um, the experience of writing a play and then having um, people read it and not understand the humor where my writing, I tend to write in a hum with humor and uh, just getting that point across of people understanding the Chicano kind of humor or whatever. Um, and uh, going back and having people read it aloud and then say, oh, I thought I was really afraid for this character. I, I thought that they were, you know, they were in, in danger. And uh, when it was just like, it, it's just like a cultural kind of difference. Um, I just think that it's, it's, difficult I think in some ways when you're writing with a specific voice and your audience that is reading and perhaps selecting um, doesn't have that ear or that um, that perspective and and how frustrating that can be as a writer when um, you think you've written it in a way that is very approachable and very um, um, you know, just the way it should sound. And then just the interpretation of it is something that is just so off of what you've written. But then when they hear it aloud, then they're like, oh, I get it. So that's a frustration for me. Like how it's, it's, it's difficult to, um, cause I know when we're like submitting, we're, we don't know who's reading these plays. And, um, and it's just, you know, I, I don't know, it's just a frustration for myself because I'm thinking, well, I put something out there, what is the interpretation? And I'm honing it better, but um, how do you kind of go from like keeping your own perspective and your own creative way of, of communication, um, but then also appealing to those audiences that are the, the people that are reading and selecting? You know, yeah. that's that's just kind of a frustration. I don't know. You might have some ideas about that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. Melissa Fast Horse's work is um, is famously you have to hear it. It's the rhythms don't they don't translate to the page the way she writes, and that's something that she had to go through too a lot working with her her work as well. Thank you for that, Nina. Viviana. Yeah, I just, um, I happened to find myself uh, this afternoon, I stumbled into the TCG Zoom for new play development and dramaturgy. Don't know how I ended up there. Um, but I wanted to share something uh, one of the people said for Solana. Um, it was, uh, his name was, let me look at my notes. I was the note taker. Um, it was this guy named Lamar, who's uh, uh, the first black man in his uh, department at the Old Globe. Um, and he said something that was like, that just really stuck with me. Um, he's, he like, cause a lot of people ask him like, why are you going to this super white institution? Like you're the only person of color. Um, like why do that? Why put yourself to that? Um, and he said that like for him, like the resistance is taking up space. Um, but like that, that's not for everyone that emo that he does a lot of emotional labor having to like teach, um, like his, uh, like, su like superiors, like things all the time. Um, he's been doing it for years, but like that's a choice he makes. Um, and not everyone has the emotional bandwidth to do that. Um, and that's just like an individual choice, like person by person. As for like performing whiteness to get into white spaces, I think about that a lot as an actor. 
um because that's mostly where I've had to do that I did acting and I just graduated and I did acting in undergrad um and I came into it like very much like not knowing about like the dynamic of oh there's a white director and I'm a person of color and you cast me and I don't know why because you there's always some political choice happening when you're a person of color and you get cast on stage there's always is um so like I didn't I um I was like I had like very aggressive white directors so I was just always taught to like not speak up um and it wasn't until I had a a white director that was like super woke and was like I want to hear every single thought you're having like even if it's scary um it wasn't until like I had her as a director that I realized that the only way you can find other people that will support like your point of view is if you just are yourself <laughs> from the beginning like I would rather I would rather deter a bunch of white people as soon as I walk into a room than like bow down to them and then end up not being heard anyway um but I guess it's different it is different when you're storming the castle as like theater management I don't know anything about that I think as an artist you just you just get to be ah screw you <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna like couch out anything till somebody I want to work with comes along like I get like I think we have more leeway because you know we get to have artist personality I imagine for like theater management it's different um well, I think yeah uh, I think it's a person to person thing I think Lala put in the chat I can tell you who's reading these plays from the regional theater and that's yeah they definitely hire the interns you know, and the people that they hire are not generally people of color. And so they're not getting, they don't get the language. And and then you're forced to maybe, if, if you really wanna get produced, you're forced to whitewash your work. And I think that is a little bit of a death in itself, you know, to have to do that, to be heard by these institutions who don't really give a shit about you anyway, right? So, um, but again, like I emphasized, I wanna storm those castles too. I'm gonna to take one question from Gina and then I think we're kind of ready, yeah, Theo? Trying to close down. Okay, so one last question from Gina. Hi. Um, no, my, I, I don't have a question. It's more of a comment. I just wanted to um, say that. Uh, yeah, I've been feeling so. Hi, everybody. First, sorry, <laughs> didn't say hi. Um, I've been feeling very deflate, deflated lately with everything, of course, and very unproductive uh, and uncreative. But this conversation today has been so inspiring, and I just want to give a shout out to the young voices that are joining us today and that have participated and um, shared their thoughts and their feelings. And I have so much hope in you guys um, in joining us in this fight, um, because when some of us don't have the energy, other of us can take the lead and then we help each other that way. Um, and so it's been really, really inspiring to see you all um, joining us and speaking up and taking, taking the space to, to speak up. I, wanna, I want you guys to continue to do that. Um, and, and the second thing I wanted to say is I'm a theater professor. And so I, I, I see all of this structure and that's part of the reason why I feel so deflated right now as well. Um, and I wanted to say this conversation that just um, arose here with uh, Tladlox uh, mentioning how um, we have to kind of make our way into those uh, seats. Um, well, it's also, it's also what we, how we train in the academy. Um, we, we, we have to stop just training actors for the uh, entertaining industry. That theater is much more than that. And I just really want um, our theater departments to reflect that. Um, yeah, so that's it. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, and, and I'm seeing that more and more young people are demanding changes in the curriculum that, that we need to make new canons. We are writing training that reflects the diversity of our country today. Those plays exist and you should be doing them. You should not be doing another version of Waiting for Lefty. <laughs> you should not. <laughs> exactly. There's a lot of new wonderful work and it, or old wonderful work actually. It exists, it's there. They're just not looking for it. I was actually musing today that I don't think I played a single Latina in my time at school ever. I was looking at the roles and I realized, no, never. I never even touched a Latinx character. But, so uh, thank you for this fabulous conversation. I know we could talk for a really long time, but it's been uh, exciting to be with you and to hear what you're all thinking because that, I am on the, the need, I need you. I need to be fed by what you're saying, how you're feeling, what you're, so that 
with what I can do, I can advocate. And then I can also go back and actually do my own writings because I am held up by you as much as I hold you up. So thank you. And thank you, Tlaloc and Thea, for having me. This was really great. Yeah, well, you know, um, I'm going to keep writing plays for Diana. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and look at all these beautiful people. They'll, they'll, uh, the, I hope that, that um, we are writing them right for, for them. them. And yeah. well, I mean, that's what we can do. Um, I, I, I do want to entertain the idea of maybe like starting, a, I, I know not everybody's on Facebook and it's like evil, but I could start a, a, a private group amongst people who have participated in this. And, and if anybody wants to join, we can do that. I can also start a Instagram group. Maybe, I don't know if there's an Instagram group at all. I have no idea. Anyway, we'll figure something out. But as soon as we do, we'll- I'll we'll get on Discord. That. I, we it's have cool. people who uh, there, we have people who were sharing um, their contact info, but you know if we have a centralized place, we can mm -hmm. we can say, hey, I have this play. Does anybody want to be in a you know reading? We can do that. Yeah, and I'm I'm very findable. You can just Google me and find my name and and ask questions. I, I like I said earlier, we're super accessible. I love to talk to people. I love to, like I said, I'll, you can yell at me if you want to. I don't care. Let's talk. I'm, right. I'm so into it. So, uh, Diana, where can people find you on New Play Exchange? Um, the New Play Exchange on La Twitter. Um, I think I'm Lola Diana on Twitter, but I'm very, very bossy and evil on Twitter. Uh, La Diana Burbano on Instagram. I'm not quite as bossy and evil. And of course, the Facebook, if, if we must go there. <laughs> All right. Okay. Gracias, Diana. It's, Gracias, it's, uh, this is the second time we've talked. We also did a podcast a couple weeks ago. So if you guys want to listen to that, it was through Ashland New Plays. Ashland New Play Festival. Yeah, yeah. Where we yeah. talked about this and mental health and all kinds of cool stuff. Um, all right. Mira, you guys stay safe. If you're protesting, make sure people know where to find you. <laughs> and um, I'd love to see you all back again on Monday where we have, and she's here, Marisa Chivas Preston. Very cool. All right. Gracias a todos. I'll see you on Monday. Gracias. Nos vemos. Oh, I am saving the chat before we get off of here. Uh, and I will email it to Tlaloc so you'll have it for everybody. Great. Mm, bye. Ready. Drink your see water. See you on Monday. Drink your water, you know. Get some rest. We love you. Bye.